Hi all, welcome to my channel, welcome to John's Model Making. Today we have Spitfire issue 87 and 88. Now in 87 we complete the actual display base and we fit a speaker. Brill. And in issue 88 we literally do nothing but have a look at this uh, wing panel. Which I have here. So let's have a quick look. This is very heavy, which is brilliant. Let's go down to the packaging. Oh, there we go. There we go. Oh, look, it's beautiful. I'll have another look at that afterwards. Excellent. That's brilliant. Much anticipated of these uh, issues. Um, 89 and 90 have arrived also. There's another bit of panelling. That looks absolutely fantastic. Um, let's see. 89, I'm afraid, is still in its packaging. But anyway, let's get on with the build. Okay, so now we have the parts. We have. Um, 8701, 8702, 8703, which are the panels, all still in paper, wrapped up nicely. And then we have 8704 and 8705, which is the speaker and its housing. And 8706 and 8707 are screws. Now that looks as though that can go straight onto the panel, just in here. And then we can just put the panels in place. Now, I am going to be putting some artificial grass on the panels, but I'll let you have a look at them before I do so. Anyway, let's get the parts open and crack them. My bad, H706 is actually the label for this cable. So that's the first thing we can do. The actual speaker was already in its housing, so that's nice and bonny. Um, it basically just wants us to put that there, like that, screw it in, four places, and we're done. But first of all, we should put this label on the cable. It reads CB. It doesn't have to be perfect, so long as you can read it when you've got it on. And basically you want this arrangement of the speaker in its housing. There's a groove there. Yep. And you can see the cable coming out. So that is actually bang on. Just there like that. And then we need the screws. Excellent stuff. I am so pleased that we've got back to doing the, the plane. That's the first screw. The second screw. That's the third, and here's the last screw. Brilliant. Now I've got some batteries for all this. Don't ask us to put any in. Uh, but so I'll leave it as it is. There we go, that's the speaker in place. Lovely jubbly. Have a close up of that. There we go. Nice and bonny. Nothing to it, absolutely nothing to it. All right, now I'm going to have to make some adjustments to the cameras so I can get all these panels in shot. 
bear with me okay now we're back in again now there's three panels as we all know um, this is the first panel in this corner and that sits in nicely there uh, the middle panel obviously has this cut out for that motor which fits perfectly there and then in this far corner this panel has a cut out and it goes right into the corner over here I'll show you that in a sec that fits there you can just see it there let's have a look on the other camera there we go I'll bring that one in there we go obviously that is to get access to the batteries now I have fitted some artificial grass on these three panels uh, I'm going to do these two panels so this panel and this panel I'm going to put artificial grass on and then lastly I'll put artificial grass on here but I'll make that separate so I can easily take that off I'm not going to be too bothered the fact that you're going to see lines and joins or whatever that doesn't really matter because it's going to be above head height for me this um, so I'm really not going to see much of the grass because I've also bought a back scene which is out of a hanger like that and that I'm going to fit um, once I get the acrylic case I've also got some um, uh, sky scene as, uh, scenery as well uh, I could get my words out um, but that's still rolled up some of it's on the wall already but that is for my other works that I've got but uh, I think that looks pretty good got this from I think it was Coastal Kits uh, Blackpool it's got it's own little stand uh, two feet as well there we go display background coastalkits.co.uk and the artificial grass I got from uh, a local um, uh, model shop in Bolton uh, Gage Master uh, it's a uh, summer mixture from Javit I've got the rest of it here there we go not Javit, Javis sorry there we go static hairy grass map summer mixture Javis scenic materials right. the only problem I have or have had with this uh, this grass is it becomes quite loose but if you use her lacquer like I did and spray it it keeps it in place so you don't get all little bits of there and everywhere which can happen so I've already sprayed the rest of uh, the other grass I just need to put it uh, on these panels now anyway that's it for this issue the first issue so let's have a look at that uh, wing frame oh sorry wing panel I should say put it back in its box as you can see now this is absolutely looks absolutely beautiful there we go that's a better look this is a better camera um, that looks pretty good obviously we don't fit it in this issue more's the pity but I will test fit it first uh, make sure none of this gets in the way a bit sitting nicely on the plane I won't imagine it does but you never know oh it's beautiful that and round nose look fantastic as well the rivets beautiful that's kind of like gorgeous when it's on the plane anyway that's that now what we can do we can have a look at what is in the magazines 
Right, the first article. Alastrian House, a peaceful haven for the RAF. Alastrian House was a country retreat in Scotland that had been built in 1905. It became one of the places where RAF personnel could spend days of pe peaceful leave, far from the airfields from which they normally operated. The name is a Latin motto meaning a place of honour by the hearth of the winged heroes of the stars. Well, would you believe main picture? Alastrian House on the Cromer estate was originally called the House of Cromer. Lady MacRobert renamed it after the death of her sons. The building is still owned and maintained by the MacRobert Trust and now serves as a retirement home, partially supported by the RAF Benevolent Fund. Excellent. And then on the next page, we have the Aegean and the Balkans. A handful of Spitfire squadrons were involved in bitter fighting over the Aegean Sea and the Balkans from September 1943. In the main picture, we have a Spitfire Mark 9 from number 94 squadron photographed in May 1944. At that time, the squadron was based in Libya, escorting bombers from the South African Air Force on raids against Axis forces in the southern Aegean Sea. During its invasion of Greece in 1940, Italy also seized the docket. Oh, Dodecanese Islands in the Aegean. You can say that again. Following the Italian surrender in early September 1943, the Allies attempted to occupy them. However, on 11th of September, be before British troops could be landed on the latest island of Rhodes, the Germans seized control. Alarmed by this, the governors of Kos, Leros, and Samos sided with the Allies and agreed to accept British garrisons. The units earmarked included two fighter squadrons that were to be based on Kos, although if German occupation of Rhodes effectively gave them a degree of uh, superiority. There we go, that goes on for a couple of pages. In the next article we have number 1453 squadron, initially formed as a night fighter, flight to defend Malta in 1941, number 1435 squadron was raised to full unit status in 1942 to become the only RAF flying squadron to employ a four digit number. And in the main picture, members of number 1453 squadron endure the heat at Brindisi in early 1944. At the time, the unit was equipped with Spitfire Mark 9s. And the main article, lacking sufficient available aircraft to be established as a full squadron, number 1435 flight was formed through the redesignation of the motor night fighter unit at Takale on the 4th of December 1941. Inheriting the latter's Hurricane 2s, the flight was tasked with patrolling the night skies over the besieged island fortress until Spitfire quick squadrons began to arrive on motor in the spring of 1942. Excellent stuff. That goes on a couple of pages. Then the next article. We have the British Pacific Fleet. With the war in Europe winding down, the Royal Navy sent its most powerful striking force to the Pacific, where it was usually assigned secondary roles as adjunct to its ma massive US counterparts. In the main picture, we have the Royal Navy ships of the British Pacific Fleet in 1945. The main article The British Pacific Fleet BPF was formed on 22nd of November 1944 from the Eastern Fleet which had mostly operated in the Indian Ocean. By the end of 1944, the early war British aircraft had largely been replaced by more modern American types such as the Chance Bot, Corsair and the Grumman Hellcat and Avenger. The Fairy Firefly entered service as a replacement for the Fulmar fighter but proved more useful in the ground attack role with rockets and bombs. That goes on for if four pages altogether. Quite a few pictures there. And then, come to the back page, your next side parts, we've seen a panel for the top of the port wing. Excellent. That is issue 88, and as we've already seen the parts, we can go straight into the magazine. And on the first article, we have At Home with Mrs. Day, Everyday Life in the Blitz. The Ministry of Information was set up the day after the war broke out on 4th September 1939. It's had the task of giving British people information to help them survive during the rigours of wartime. 
the ministry used posters, films and sets of photographs such as these about Mrs. Day to get its message across. And in the main picture we have Mrs. Day has taken up the carpets on her staircases and is laying a roll of fireproof material and asbestos compound. The bomb damage from previous areas can be clearly seen in the broken boarded up window and the plaster has dropped from the ceiling. Mrs. Day is middle class and lives in a large house in a wealthy area of West London. Unlike everybody else. There we go, we've got quite a few pages of this, quite a few pictures of Mrs. Day going about her daily life. She was useful in the day, definitely. And on the next article, USAAF Spitfire Climax. The last actions involving USAAF Spitfire fighters in the Mediterranean took place during the spring of 1944, after which they were replaced by P 51B Mustangs. In the main picture we have Spitfire Mark 9s of the 31st Fighter Group's 39th Fighter Squadron approached the end of their service with the USAAF at Castle Volturno in April 1944. In his official report on the 31st Fighter Group's activities for the month of March 1944, Staff Officer Major Albert Levy recorded the group was operating from Castle Volturno Landing Ground, a pierced steel planking strip near the mouth of the Volturno River. The weather was mild, Colonel Charles M. McCorkle continued to command, leading the group on some missions and directing operations. Although the focus for our 31st Fighter Group squadrons continued to be Anzio, the 52nd Fighter Group flew some sweeps over southern France as the weather at last began to improve. And that article goes on for a couple of pages. On the next one we have number 417 Squadron. Canadian man number 417 squadron achieved battle honours for its service on the channel front in North Africa over Sicily and in the fight for Italy. In the main picture we have equipped with Spitfire Mark 8, number 417 squadron was based at Vanafro near Naples in the spring of 1944. Number 417 squadron was formed at Chermy Down in Somerset on 27th of November 1941 the unit being the Royal Canadian Air Force's 7th Fighter Squadron established overseas. It was initially equipped with Spitfire Double One As, although these were replaced by Spitfire VBs in February 42, just prior to number 417 Squadron becoming operational. The squadron was destined to see no action in England, however, for on 25th of March it was withdrawn from operations in order to prepare to move overseas. Excellent stuff. And in the, I think this is the last article, we have, yep, Allied Jets of World War II. The Allies lagged behind Germany in its jet developments and subsequently their jet fighters saw relatively little action in the war. However, they were more mature aircraft and went on to have long post-war careers. And in the main picture we have the first US Lockheed P-80 shooting star jet fighters to serve in Europe during the 55th fighter group at Kibelstadt in Germany in 1946 and remained there for 18 months. Gibelstadt. <laughs> Maybe. In the main article, RAF officer Frank Whittle began work on gas turbines when he was still a cadet aircraft mechanic at Cromwell. He patented the idea of a turbojet engine in 1931 when he was only 24 years old and formed a company, Power Jets Limited, in 1936 to develop his invention. With only £2,000 initial capital, the company ran its first prototype in April 37, but it was not until June 39 that the Air Ministry saw its potential and ordered a flight capable engine and an airframe to fit in it. Excellent stuff. That goes on for four pages, so that will be an absolutely brilliant read. And then on to the back page, your next set of parts. A wing panel for the left wing, small panels and parts for the wing flap indicator. Lovely jubilee. Brilliant. Well there we go. Those are the parts. That's all that fitted. There's three panels. Looks a bit wobbly there, but that's because it's on this desk. The uh, Bolt nuts underneath make it look um, like that. When I put it back up on the shelf, it's to be perfectly level. And there, here's the wing panel. Excellent stuff. 
Okay, doke. Anyway, that was brilliant. That I really enjoyed that. Um, get these panels all sorted, and we'll be uh, well nearly there. Not far off now. Another ten more issues, and the plane should be complete. I think we've got another four before Christmas, so that's brilliant. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. Like just as much as I did. If you did, please give us a big thumbs up, subscribe, hit that notification bell, and I'll see you in a couple of weeks for the next couple of issues. Thanks for watching. Stay safe. Bye for now.